College of Art and Design and an MFA from the University of Texas at Austin. And she just told me that she was just awarded a grant from the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage uh, Foundation to continue uh, working on a project on the spillway, the Juan right. Carré spillway, yeah. um, which is, uh, forms a previous body of work that I actually probably know better than the ones we're going to see today. So I'm excited <laughs> to see some new work. So please join me in welcoming Lily Brooks. speaking about this really powerful body of work and um, showing my work in this context. So I'm thrilled um, for the opportunity. So um, uh, what, I'm, what I'm going to do is start by speaking about the work that Tina has made over the past seven years, this, um, this body of work called Lamentations. And so we'll sort of walk through the gallery together, if everybody can hang with that, um, and, uh, and look at a few pieces that I find particularly interesting. Um, and then I have two bodies of work with me. One is, an, uh, both are ongoing bodies of work um, that I'd like to show you quickly that um, have to do with similar subject matter. So, um, so let's, let's walk this way, if you would. Um, so, um, one of the reasons that I think that, or one of the ways that I think that this body of work functions most powerfully is in the fact that these diptychs have been created. So, um, as many of you I'm sure know, um, Tia has been working in the wetlands of Louisiana as well as in glacial regions um, uh, throughout the, the uh, Arctic regions. And looking at land loss here in Louisiana and the destruction of the wetlands that is the result of both climate change and extractive industries um, that have damaged the uh, landscape here, and then the ice melt that's happening in um, these glacial landscapes. And so the, the, one of the things that photography often does is it gives us a chance to see things um, in a new context and uh, in a new sequence that generates fresh meaning for the work. And that is certainly the case here. So for me, one of the things that I think about when I look at these pieces and the way that they're placed together is that the space between them is the most generative thing. Um, it's almost, I mean, the, the photographs are beautiful and um, totally seductive physically. Um, I always tell my students, Frederick Sommer said once, um, <laughs> Uh, never let anyone talk to you about a physical splendor. Um, and so I'm always like, get that fit right, right? Gotta make those testers. So um, that is certainly working on us here, right? The beauty makes us want to look at the work, um, and that is really important. But it's the things that we can't see in between the connection that we make as viewers that I think is the most, in some ways, the most powerful. Um, and having spent quite a bit of time here in the galleries looking at the show in preparation for this, um, I've heard so much great conversation, eavesdropping, <laughs> other viewers, um, talking about the reality of climate change. And it's, it's working, Tina, like that it's totally effective. Um, and so I think that that is, that is really exciting and, um, and important work that you're doing. So thank you for that. Um, so the work is often paired um, according to some kind of formal organization. So the way that um, these two pieces, for instance, both for me bring up um, maybe like they look like lace almost, right? Um, and there, in this case, the perspective is really similar. I think something that's also interesting is when the perspective is really different. So if you follow me into here. Um, this photograph is from Greenland, and this photograph is from Plaquemines Parish. And um, of course, the, the the composition of the images sort of mimics each other, right? Um, and that ties them together. But then the perspective is so different. So when I look at them, I really think about my um, my own ability to see, and um, and the, the what photography can give us as far as 
um, this unusual view or a window to a world that otherwise we wouldn't have access to. Um, and uh, I also think about um, this idea of these two landscapes being effectively erased. So in some ways, the subject matter of this work is eventual invisibility. Um, and so to me, it uh, makes so much sense to use photography to address that. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it would be great if everybody could just take a look for a few minutes and, and spend some time um, with these, these pieces back here also have this nice formal relationship to each other. This, this mound, which is created by the extractive industry, so what I understand is that it's, uh, it's earth that was dug out to create a canal. That's one of the re many reasons that our marshlands and wetlands are, um, are dying is because of the canals that were dug by the petrochemical industry. Um, and then next with this glacier, which is which is melting into the sea. So there's this sort of like push-pull of the direction of things too, and I think that is also really um, effective and beautiful. And the shift in scale also, I think, in the works within the room is really effective. When I stand here in front of this piece, it sort of takes up my peripheral vision, and with this one, I want to get really close, so I have to study very carefully. So it becomes like, one is almost, um, uh, more of an intellectual engagement, and this one is maybe more of a physical engagement. Mm -hmm. So I think that, yeah, I think the work, the body of work is extremely powerful. And if you haven't gotten a chance to see the book, the book is also very beautiful, and the writing sort of flushes out the history and the science behind all of this. And um, so I think it's a thoroughly, um, deeply researched and um, thoughtful body of work. So again, thank you, Tina. Um, so, um, thinking about this idea of erasure or invisibility, um, in my own work that's something that I think about a lot. I'm, I'm trying to address these different landscapes and relationships that we have with our changing climate and also with daily weather. Um, so, I'd love to show you these couple bodies of work, one that's been made all over the country and one that has been made primarily here in Louisiana. And so, So I spent most of my adult life um, in the Northeast, and in 2011 I moved to Austin, Texas to start graduate school. Um, so uh, I thought I was moving to the South. Turns out I was totally wrong. Texas is not the South as we are probably all expert on, but um, uh, my naive Yankee self thought uh, that was what was happening. But it was very hot when I moved there, I will say that much. So. I moved to Austin um, during what was to that date the hottest, one of the hottest summers on record. We had um, 90 consecutive days over 100 degrees. So coming from the Northeast, this was a total disruption to my, not only my, my whole life, right, moving across the country is a disruption, but also to my, my physical um, well-being. <laughs> so um, if you've ever experienced excessive heat like that, I mean, it was, you know, 100, 105, 110, 112 degrees outside 
for all these days in a row. Um, so uh, I felt like it was the only thing I could think about was how hot I was. And I was just sort of groaning and groaning, right? I was just, I was sweating and I was sort of dying. Um, but not really. Um, the, so the first photograph that I made uh, when I came to Austin was this photograph. Um, because I thought, if this is the only thing that's occupying my consciousness, then I should probably make a photograph about the heat. So I went to the newspaper stand on what to that day was the hottest day of the year, and I purchased a newspaper. It happened to be the Wall Street Journal because it had the best looking weather map. It's not my publication of choice, but <laughs> um, not all the time. Um, so uh, anyway, I cut the map out of the newspaper and I stuck it to the inside of my apartment window, which was blissfully air-conditioned. So I was able to make a picture about the heat without going out into the landscape with my gigantic view camera and my polyester dark cloth. Um, so um, from that photograph, uh, the picture sort of sat on the wall of my studio for months, and I kept coming back to it as I was trying to make other pictures addressing heat in you know, maybe a more conceptual way, thinking about designer, and color and things like that. Um, and in those months, these natural and unnatural disasters were happening around me. So there was a wildfire in Bastrop, Texas, which burned 1,600 homes. Um, there were ranchers selling off their cattle because they just couldn't afford to keep them fed in water because of the drought. So um, I understood that this experience with this heat wave and drought was, it was affecting my body and it was very personal and sort of disruptive. But it was also um, uh, a total catastrophe. It was, a, it was a, an emergency, and it was um, creating real consequences. So I became interested in thinking about how, how could this like sort of innocuous little map, this happy little shape of the country, um, represent both this daily thing, this prediction of this daily encounter with the natural world, and also the evidence of this broader, um, more serious disaster. We were a part of. So I decided to find, figure out where that information came from. Like, whose job is it to visualize and track this thing? And that took me to um, this place, which is New Braunfels, Texas. If you want to come closer, <laughs> <laughs> it might be good to see them all okay. closer. So this is the National Weather Station uh, in service station in New, uh, New Braunfels, Texas, which is just outside Austin. Um, now, I don't want to go on about it, but I have found that most meteorologists are amateur photographers, so they are very happy to um, give me access and advice um, about the shutter speeds and things like that. <laughs> so um, I, uh, so I, I found this place to be amazing, and I also started photographing at a weather station that's in Massachusetts that I remembered from um, a field trip that I had been on as a child. And that place is where this photograph was made, and that's the Blue Hill Meteorological Observatory, um, which is just outside Boston. And, it, and there they've been collecting weather data every day since 1885. Um, so uh, I, I thought about like these, these mostly men who work in these spaces where it's like their task to grasp this information and understand it and translate it to us. And these are all photographs of different types of clouds that were made by meteorologists um, and then organized sort of haphazardly, printed maybe at Walgreens or something, and organized onto this little cloud board. So um, uh, in these spaces, the science that's happening is, a, is at once very sophisticated and it's also incredibly sort of like medieval or <laughs> duct taped together in these ways. Um, things don't seem like they could possibly work or be accurate. This is called a sunshine card, and it sits underneath this device called a Campbell Stokes sunshine recorder, which is a uh, glass sphere. And as the sun moves through the sky, it burns a hole into the card um, according to the strength of the sun. So for me, I, was, I, mean, I couldn't help but think about photography, of course, and the relationship with light and mark making. Um, but uh, it also just seemed like how could this be? And the meteorologist <laughs> told me that it is still the most accurate way to record cloud cover, which is amazing to me. Um, so in these places, there, were, there was all this mark making that was happening mechanically, and then there's also mark making that was happening by hand. Um, so I kept coming back to like 
the body, and I think that's because it started with my own physical experience. Um, but this, for instance, is a rain gauge that's been cut so that um, birds will not sit on the edge of it and defecate into it and skew the data. <laughs> yeah. um, and I thought it looked kind of like folk art or some kind of menacing crown. Um, again, this, is, uh, this has to do with sort of the body. This is a, a record of the first and latest frost, and they call it the first, earliest and latest killing. And so I love the poetry of that. Before I went to graduate school, um, I was working at Harvard in the libraries, very deep, deep in a very dark basement, um, and photographing <laughs> old, flat, precious things. And so I think that experience, which it was in some ways very interesting and productive, was also um, really kind of boring and a little bit of torture. I realized that I don't want to be dealing with inanimate objects. I'm more interested in people. Um, but but the um, uh, but that that experience, I think, and my the affection and appreciation that I um, had for for paper things is also in the work. So um, I was I was able to access this archive at the National Weather Service Station in New Braunfels, which is actually more like a closet full of old books. But <laughs> <laughs> so um, again, in this piece, there's this handwriting, and so coming back to thinking about the hand and the body. Um, I read somewhere that actually the, the first hydronomers, which um, uh, measure humidity, uh, were made of human hair. And so I started to think about how the body could also be um, uh, an instrument for understanding this information. So a friend of mine said she had a terrible sunburn and I this picture of her. So, um, in the body of work, and I'm not showing all of it to you right now, there are photographs of the body, these instruments, um, different presentations of this data, and then also the landscape. So um, this photograph was made in Idaho during a wildfire, a distant, very distant wildfire. Um, and this is that forest in Bastrop that was uh, burned outside of Austin about a year later. So thinking about the kind of slow trace of this threat, this is on Martha's Vineyard, and I read about these cliffs eroding because of rising sea levels, and I knew that the cliffs had this beautiful pigment in them. The clay there is this like, beautiful color, so I, I went specifically to make these pictures because I was like, I was actually looking for a pink picture to go with the sun. <laughs> Um, and so when I present the work, when I exhibit the work, and I, sh I had the opportunity, thanks to Christina Molina, to show this work at the front um, last year. And uh, when I show it, these pictures are all intertwined. And so maybe in a way that is in some ways similar to what Tina's doing here, I'm putting them together to make these connections between color and composition. And to ask us sort of like, how is it that we can have this um, daily interaction with the weather, which is maybe sometimes the only time we consider our relationship to the natural world, right, when we're uncomfortable or the sun is too bright or something like that. Um, uh, how is it that we can have those interactions and then not also understand the consequences of what we do and how we operate and what's happening to our climate? Um, um, so, in when I moved to Louisiana, actually before I moved to Louisiana, this is one of my first Louisiana pictures here. I made this from the um, from the edge of the old river control structure. So does anybody here know about that place? Yeah. Up river from here. Yeah. Is that yeah. where it goes to the water goes to the Atchafalaya? Exactly. Yeah. So the old river control structure um, diverts water from the Mississippi into the Atchafalaya, and it's one of many of these um, uh, river control structures that are on the lower half of the Mississippi River. Um, so I went there to, because I was interested in thinking about the, um, these, the built environment as sort of a monument to climate change and to also to our total vulnerability to it. Um, and I made this photograph from the, from the edge of that structure looking down, and this is debris from the 2011 Mississippi flood. And I made the picture in 2015. So it's still sitting there, this sort of like blatant trace of this thing. 
Um, and so through that, that brought me to this next body of work, which has been made um, entirely within the Bonnie Carey spillway. Um, so I went to the spillway first because I thought that it would end up being part of this work. And it, you know, in, in, we all hope that one thing will lead to the next, and that's what's happened here for me, and um, I'm so grateful for that. But um, so the, the Bonnie Carey Spillway, many of you I'm sure have driven over it, right? The I-10 crosses the spillway, and it's this sort of spooky looking haunted landscape with um, dying cypress trees all through it. It's quite, it's visually arresting landscape. Um, but the spillway itself was constructed in the, it was, construction was started in 1929 and finished in 1931. It's a 7,000 foot um, structure, and you can see it right here. If you want to come closer so you can really see. So the structure is made of concrete, and then it has these bays. They're um, creosote timbers that come down into the bays. The structure runs parallel to the Mississippi River, and, um, and uh, the, the structure is about a mile and a half long. So, um, when the river gets too high, this flood control structure is opened and it allows the river to flow into this landscape, which is about 10 square miles. The landscape is contained on either side by levees that are about seven miles long, and that directs the water and contains it and puts it out into Lake Pontchartrain, which then goes into Florida and the Gulf of Mexico. And as maybe you've read, recent openings have really affected the ecology of the coast of Mississippi. It's one of the reasons why many of the beaches were closed um, this past summer. So um, when I first discovered the place, I was mostly interested in the structure itself um, and thinking of, again about it as a type of monument. But it's also undeniable that it is situated in the middle of this, in of the heart of petrochemical America. Um, and so, of course, I was thinking about Mizrak and, um, and thinking about the way that we exist in the era of the Anthropocene and how our, um, our, our actions and our activity sh has shaped the landscape in so many different ways. Um, so I've been going there very consistently. This picture was made in 2016. But for about the past year and a half, I've been living there um, in a more dedicated way. And this is a picture that was made right before the structure was opened in um, February of this year. So um, again, the structure was created as a response to the Great Flood of 1927, which flooded um, you know, gigantic areas of land. It was a huge huge uh, disaster up and down the Mississippi River. Um, and so um, uh, since then, the structure has been opened um, 14 times. The, originally, the Army Corps uh, thought that it would be opened about once every 10 years. Um, and it's actually been opened six times in the last eight years. Um, so as climate change has become more and more of a reality and there is more rainfall throughout the entire Mississippi River Basin, right, the runoff from this entire country comes right to us. Um, and, uh, and so the need to activate this space by flooding it has become uh, more and more present. So there's evidence of the science and the tracking that's happening there. It's almost like a a laboratory unto itself. This is when the bays are open. So you can see the water is coming through quite violently. Uh, 2018 and 19 are the first time that the uh, structure has been opened in back-to-back -back years. And in 2019, it was actually opened twice, once in February and then once in May, for a total of 122 days. In the spring, I was lucky to um, get myself onto an airboat with the Army Corps, my friend Rusty, the Army Corps engineer stranger, picked me up. And, um, and so I was able to get right out there into the landscape, which was pretty amazing. 
And so here you're looking through the bays at the river coming at you, and in the distance that's Dow and Taft across the river. How, how quick is that exposure? Very quick. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they must be rocking yeah. at that point. Yeah, it was a, it was a very um, bright day, so I was able to to make it happen. But it's still a four foot five. Or? No, this is digital. Oh, that's yeah, right. this yeah, picture okay. is made digitally. Yeah. So I'm going back and forth now. Most of most of the we have to count the clouds is all four by five. Um, most of it's four by five. And um, now I'm going back and forth between the two. Yeah, yeah. 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 screaming here about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, I don't. I mean, I would try, but yeah. I yeah, but no, I didn't have. I had to have, happen to have the digital camera. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you know, I think I, Deanne Arvis said the camera is a license, and she was talking about it in a very different context. But I often think about that with this these two bodies of work. It sort of puts me in these places where maybe. I wouldn't have ever thought I had any business being, but I'm thrilled to have the opportunity. Um, this is looking out from I-10 when the spillways open. And I saw this, I was here for something, I can't remember what, and I had to work, I had to teach at 8 a.m. I teach at Southeastern up in Hammond. And, um, and so I was driving over the spillway very early in the morning, and um, I saw the, the sun rising over the lake and I thought, that is a picture. I have to come back and make it. And so I did. And it was a little dicey. I probably shouldn't have been getting out of my car on that bridge. But. <laughs> the other thing that happens in this landscape that I'm really interested in is, the, um, is that when it's not flooded, it looks just like the rest of southeastern Louisiana. It's this very um, fertile landscape with cypress trees and tons of wildlife. There's some little birds that are roosting in the center of this photograph here. So um, in part, the landscape is managed by the Department of Wildlife and Fisheries. Um, they stock the ponds when these haven't been flooded in a while and they need to so that people can fish there. The town of Destrehan has a, um, has a campground and a pavilion, so it's used as this site for recreation and it is full of men who are hunting with guns and um, fishing and, uh, and also families using it having picnics and things like that. So there's um, this uh, sort of joy and communion happening there along these levels of violence that are you know, a byproduct of hunting and fishing. I'm not a vegetarian. <laughs> this is a catfish, I believe. And all of that happens um, in startling contrast to the history of the place. So before the Army Corps took over this land in 1929, um, there were two plantations that abutted each other there in the river. And uh, they were sugar plantations, as much of this section of the river was. And so um, in the landscape, there are actually two uh, graveyards that were used to bury enslaved people who were working on those plantations from the early 1800s, and then their descendants up until um, 1929. And so there were also some Union troops of color who were buried there. Those bodies were, those remains were moved by the government in 1929 to the cemetery at Chalmette. Um, the rest of the people's remains were left in those two cemeteries. And so they still remain unmarked. There's a tiny little oak tree that has been planted at each of them, but there's no other marking of the space. Um, the cemeteries were sort of rediscovered uh, in 1975 when a flood disrupted the earth so much that um, the remains of some of those folks came to the surface. So um, to me, that connection between the petrochemical industry and this, um, this extractive violence and the history of other types of violence and torture that have happened there is, um, I'm trying to figure out how to address that and I think it's really important. Um, this is the edge of the levee and the light from Dow. Third. That's okay. And 
so um, some of these photographs, this was made just maybe a month ago. So because the uh, floodway was flooded for 122 days, the spring and summer, um, there is all of this mark that's left there. The landscape has really completely transformed. It's shocking. I mean, we know that that's what the, li the river is supposed to do, right? It's supposed to leave sediment and debris so that things can grow and thereby we have a healthy landscape that protects us from storms. Um, but it's, it's also quite arrestingly beautiful the way that these traces are left there. So this is debris that's left actually in the flood control structure itself. This is a bay that probably wasn't open and so these little sticks have been caught in there. And this here, I'm standing with my back at the Mississippi River. I'm looking toward the spillway. So when it's um, activated, the river is much higher. Of course, I would have been well underwater. Um, but all of this sediment has been left there. I mean, it looks like a beach or something. Mm -hmm. So there's this um, this kind of like erasure that's happening physically as well as um, institutionally within the space. And I'm interested in trying to use my camera to address that. Right now I'm thinking about um, what will happen in the next month when I won't be teaching. Love my job, but I'm excited to have some time to focus on this. And so, um, thinking about ways to structure the work that um, don't place me as an authority, I, I don't feel as though I can be an authority about this landscape. Um, so, I'm hoping to conduct some interviews with folks and make some portraits, which is, I have made portraits in my life, but not often and not recently. But I think that because the landscape is used so often by, um, by people that I should find a way to uh, have their input at least into how the story is structured, so to speak. This is another one from the, from the airboat. traces. So you can see here, there's the water line there. And this is about at my eye level. And we're well, more than a mile, probably about a mile and a half into the landscape here. I um, was recently, it's actually, I think it's still activated, the, um, the fourth wall exhibition. So I was recently part of this group exhibition that was curated by Nancy Baker Cahill. She's a Los Angeles-based artist. Um, and she's geolocated artworks by different um, local artists that have to do with sites that are contested. She, the title of the show is Battlegrounds. And so um, a couple of my photographs from the spillway are located in the spillway. So my hope is that they are, um, it's very, it's effective because you're standing in the landscape that was flooded when the photograph was made and you're seeing it virtually so you sort of you download an app and you see it over your phone even though I deal with technology every day I was a little suspicious of the technology aspect of it um, but it is quite effective and, um, there's a lot of wonderful work in that show some of these the artists are here John and Hannah So this is very much still a work in progress, and I'm excited about it. This is actually right on the site of the um, Kenner Cemetery, and it's a footprint that has a little mm. oil slick on the top. Mm. And I think, um, you know, despite the darkness of the landscape it's also incredibly beautiful and um, you know it took me a minute to sort of feel connected to the landscape here it's so flat and so different from where I came from 
Um, but now I, it totally has its talents in me. I feel very, I feel very at ease, and more and more at ease in this landscape in particular. The more time I spent there, when I first went to the spillway, I felt, um, I felt sort of vulnerable there. Um, I feel less, that, less that way now. <laughs> Here's an image of the spillway as it's flooded from the riverside. So I'm also making video while I'm there. I don't know how it will end up. We'll see. But um, there's so much moving and changing. It feels like a really appropriate medium um, for the space. So I'm excited to see how that goes. Who knows? <laughs> Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. If anyone has any questions. Has been involved with Audubon Society, which does a lot along the coast. They have one that come for I um, haven't, no, but I will. I would love to. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm really interested in talking to people who are conducting science in, in both projects. Um, people have been incredibly generous um, with that information. I think with the meteorologists and also with the rangers here. A lot of people are not paying attention to what they do, so they're excited to share, and I feel grateful for that. Anything else? I was coming in this afternoon, and I came from uh, like where your school is, down across the bridges, and I noticed a couple of clear cuts mm -hmm. along the way, and I didn't know if that had anything to do with the spillway or this being wildlife and fisheries. I didn't know if you if that had any connection to all the activity in this area, or if that is something totally separate. Those, those clear cuts, what, what I understand is that those clear cuts were made um, to move timber uh -huh. and when the, the swamps were deforested, and also um, to lay pipe uh, okay. for, for oil and gas. Okay, because the ones I was noticing today were like very recent. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. I didn't no. know. I don't we know. have a lot of fishing camps back there, too. Yeah. yeah. It's just like a half question of comment, so I apologize in advance for that. Okay. <laughs> but um, I've been really reading a lot lately about various legal efforts to give threatened landscapes status related to like legal personhood. And I thought it was really interesting the way you were speaking about the body and the landscape and especially this idea of remains. Mm -hmm. And I haven't really ever seen someone frame or think about like sediment and these residues of natural action as remains mm -hmm. in that way, like thinking about these graveyards and their connection to sediment as this kind of like, in many ways also, right, quite sacred remnant of mm -hmm. natural forces that are not disconnected from people. Mm -hmm. I guess I'm just like both Thanking you for that idea, because I think it's a really powerful one, but also wondering if you have anything more you would say about that idea of remains as it relates to the really specific politics of this sediment and then these graveyards that also exist on that site. Well, um, thank you. I, I don't think I put it quite as eloquently as we just did. <laughs> but um, I guess I, I think about the, the sediment um, yeah, as like maybe like a form of evidence, um, uh, and and also as um, it does it does cover up, it does erase like the the historic surface of those graveyards is under many feet of sediment now, and so um, it, it, you know like any landscape, this landscape is regenerating. In this case, it's Old, but um, I think that that is that kind of like cyclical nature definitely for me relates to the body and, um, and life. Um, but I don't know, I, I appreciate the comment. I would love to think about that more. Just that idea of like, remains just emerge really powerfully for you is like a really interesting way that, of tying together a lot of what you're thinking about, and I haven't heard it phrased like that. So, anyway, Thank you. just an observation. They talk about climate in Europe and America. <laughs> they talk about the weather, the fires out west, blizzards up north, which you probably know, Hurricane Sound, mm -hmm. tornadoes right through the center. <laughs> yeah, and so, um, I mean, I think that the, our, our memory is short, right? We're like all um, 
we were so frazzled during Hurricane Barry when the river was so high, and it was, I mean, it, it, we, it was terrifying, um, and could have been so bad. Uh, so, but then instantly we sort of forgot that the river's down, and so everything's fine now. Um, and, and I witnessed that, and I think about that a lot in all of these landscapes, and a lot of them which are where the politics are um, not, not interested in regulation or thinking about policy that will affect um, climate, our climate. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't. I don't really know what the answer is there. Um, and I, I want. I mean, I certainly have a point of view, um, but I also want there to be kind of like an openness here. Um, I am not interested in answering my own question. Um, so uh, yeah, I hope that the work feels. Okay that way for people. Uh, I've also, I'm, during this, during making We Have to Count the Clouds, I photographed in the Midwest quite a bit. I did a residency in Kansas two summers in a row, and I photographed all of these tornado sirens that are situated in a little small town. So, um, you know, it's, it's, in some ways, it's like this incredibly generative subject matter because I can think about it wherever I am. Um, so it's, the work is really, Personal in this way, um, it's it's in, it's analytical, but it's also very personal. It's about like my own anxiety and my own reaction, my own experience in the place. Um, and I don't know how else to work, but I I think that climate change is the subject matter of many people's work, and and it is often looked at in this very analytical way. And I think Tina, this work is also stems from this incredibly personal experience for you, your history in these places. Um, and that's one of the reasons why it works, I'm sure. Where can we see your work next, or how can we keep up with what you're doing? Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so, um, I, I just became a member of the Front, and so I will be exhibiting so I will be exhibiting my work there in a new member show in January. It opens on January 11th. Mm -hmm. I, um, I received a grant from Antenna Gallery to create a quote-unquote guidebook to the spillway. Um, I feel uneasy about the word guide, but I'm going to roll with it. And so that will be published, I think, in the spring. We don't really have a firm date yet. Are you working with the core? I'm not working with the core on it, no. And so um, I, the, the term guidebook, is that's how the grant was characterized. Um, it has to be a book that addresses a specific location. So I don't know that it will have like maps and lists of botanical specimens to afford, things like that. Um, but I'm, I'm really thrilled and I'm honored to have that opportunity to publish the work in that way. You also can see Lily at Southeastern Louisiana University in Hammond, America. <laughs> <laughs> and we are so lucky and oh, privileged to have her. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna. And we'll hold on to you. Thank you to be there. I love, I love teaching, and my students teach me so much. Well, thank you, Lily, for thank coming you. today. Yes.